So welcome again to another Lipid Maps podcast. We're joined today by Professor Laura Garachi from the University of Perugia. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Matthew, for inviting me. It's really a pleasure for me to be here today. So along with colleagues in the Epilipinet Consortium, you've just published a paper in Analytical Chemistry on the uh, challenges of analysing epilipids. So firstly, can you tell us what an epilipid is? and the challenges that there are in studying them. Yes, sure, Matt. Uh, first of all, I will take just a few seconds to thank all the co-authors. As you were saying, this was the results of a collaboration uh, within the Epilipid Net Network, um, which is funded by the European Union. And the Epilipid Net is a network of hundreds of scientists of over, all over the world working in the lipidomics field. And there is a specific group that is focused on epilipids. This brings to your question, what, how we can define... What is one of these things? <laughs> yeah, exactly. How can we define epilipids? Well, a very short reply would be, well, they are um, simply modified lipids. And that's it. But to be more precise, we can say that we all know that lipids are characterized by a large chemical variability, and that chemical variability makes their function. And this is usually associated with a very well established biosynthetic roots. And these are what they, uh, these roots are defining what is called the native lipidome. But to make the figure much more complex, these native lipids can undergo additional chemical modifications, small modification through oxidation reaction or nitrations or halogenation reactions. And these slight modification can change their function and their properties. And uh, these modified lipids are uh, the result uh, of uh, a very complex variation that is called epilipidome. So the okay. epil epilipidome is composed of these epilipids that can come from different chemical reactions. And those reactions, are they chemical reactions or enzymatically catalyzed? They can be enzymatically or non-enzymatically. Non, so both. Yes, yes. So it is uh, pretty complex uh, to monitor all the modification that can occur in the native lipidome. Yeah, you know, there, there can be very many of these. Yes. And I guess that, that gives you the challenges of studying them. Yeah, if I can also add something, the epilipidome uh, or epilipids term, it's actually a very young term because it was uh, first used in our, our publication with Maria Fedorova's group in 2019, although several epilipids, like oxidized species from ecosanoids and so on, have been um, largely studied in the past. But the interest now is also on the modification of complex lipids, like uh, uh, phospholipids, oxidized phospholipids, or oxidized triacylglycerols, to try to understand that their role because it is now well known that they are also involved in physiopathological uh, uh, conditions. So it's very important to understand uh, their role. And I guess, given the, um, the complexity of the modifications, many of these will be in relatively low abundance, so yes. difficult to analyze, and certainly difficult to analyze at, at a molecular level. Yes, you know, in order yes. to determine the chirality of a hydroxyl group, for instance, you probably need more than you can ever get. Yes, that is really uh, what we call the first challenge. We tried in the review to uh, list the main challenges in the epilipidomics, uh, and the first one in our list was the low abundance of these species. And they are also transient, so sometimes it's very difficult to detect them. And uh, uh, despite uh, all the exceptional sensitivity that the new instrumentation can, can reach, still the signal of these uh, low abundance species sometimes is very close to the instrumental limit of detection. So uh, this is uh, also an instrumental limit. You were also saying uh, how far we can go uh, with the, their chemical structure. 
And the second and the third challenge we were mentioning is actually related to that, because one is the high structural diversity. Uh, if we start with, a, just to make an example, with a complex lipid like a PC containing a, a polyunsaturated fatty acid in a structure, we know that the modification will not occur all in the, in the position that can be attached by the oxygen and so on, for example. But how we can judge, it will depend on the structure, it will depend on the reaction we are taking into account, the enzymatic process, non-enzymatic process, everything changes. And this also generates a large number of isomers and isobars. And still, we are not at the level that we can easily identify each species in, the, in a complex matrix. So it's still really difficult by mass spec. And I guess yeah. you know, my, my background in structural biology is NMR and crystallography. Exactly. And while you need far less sample now than you did maybe 20, 30 years ago, you yeah. still need vastly more than you yes. would get out of the, the samples you're working with. Yeah. So in your review, you describe various software packages that uh, tackle some of these challenges to address the problems of identifying the molecule. How important is it for researchers to really understand what this software is doing? Well, in my opinion, this is extremely important because uh, the user has to be aware on how far he can go or she can go using a certain software. Yes, I, I guess you know, my, the, the second half of my question is not only what is the software doing, but specifically what is the software not doing? Not doing, yeah. exactly, because sometimes, no, uh, there is the idea that the software can solve all the problems. This is not. It depends on the workflows, the algorithm that they, they uh, include in the package, and also on the time you have for your analysis. So there are high throughput methods, low throughput methods. And uh, we also, uh, I know that you agree because we also recently published another paper uh, that is trying to guide the choice of information, informatic software and tools for lipidomics in general. So this is a real problem today, how to guide people to understand the level of knowledge you can reach with a software. And uh, for example, in the case of epilipidomics, First of all, you have to distinguish based on the level of expertise in bioinformatics or informatics, because there are several tools that are a common line maybe, or that were published, but you have to know a basic to, to work on uh, with them. And some other tools are easier uh, just because they have a graphical user interface. And therefore, everyone can be familiar with time, with the software, and with the, the results that uh, can be reached. So in the review, we are mentioning several tools, and then we focus the attention on the ones that have the graphical user and interfaces. And uh, we try to make tables and simple schemes to define which are the challenges that each software can try to solve and also the level of annotation that you can reach, because this is very important. I don't know if you want, I can make some examples. Just Yes, to... please, please do. And so, for example, um, software like LDA, Lipid Match Flow, LipoStar, MS Dial 4, uh, MZ-3 that were uh, reviewed, they all try to cope with the first four challenges. So the low abundancy, the chemical diversity, isomer and um, isomer species, the, and the different fragmentation. But then even inside uh, this list, there is a difference because the, the algorithms are different. So I invite everyone to read and to understand how they work. All of them do not uh, consider specifically the problem of the nomenclature that to us is the fifth challenge. And yes, it, that's a huge challenge. Yeah, it seems trivial, but it is absolutely not. I know that all the lipidomics community made great progresses in the last years to try to guide with a common nomenclature, but still this does not cover all the epilipidome. Uh, and more important, 
although the bases are provided, uh, the user still try to over report the results. Yes. So it's very important to realize at which level you can report an epilipid. For this, there is a specific tool that is the lipid links that we mentioned. And now several software are um, trying to link, uh, to make a link with the lipid links to convert the nomenclature in a common uh, pattern so that everyone can easily compare the results also from different software. Yes, I find over-reporting is a, a huge issue where you get double yes. bond position and chirality and you look at the data, discover that it is the not experiments, fair. there's no way from the experiments that have been carried out, you can determine what has been claimed to be determined. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And this brings me to the specific uh, issue of the lipid epilipid annotation that we tried to describe. Because the majority of the software we reviewed are uh, at the level of the elemental composition. So that means that during the annotation processing, the software will tell you, okay, this is an oxidized species coming from this native lipid plus two oxygen or plus one oxygen or plus two oxygen minus something else and so on. And so this is the level and the basic level for the majority of the software. And then there are additional you know, features that can maybe go back to the MSMS spectra and say, okay, this plus oxygen is on this chain, but these software are usually not providing the complete name of the new speeches. Uh, the only software that was specifically designed to do this work uh, at the maximum level possible from the data is LPP Tiger 2. So we described how it works. In this case, we are at the level of the type of modification that can be explained, uh, but it is of course a little bit more time consuming. And so uh, again, the community is trying to take the benefit for several software and that is already in place uh, the connection between, for example, LipoStar and LPP Tiger 2, so that part of the calculation is made in uh, high throughput software and then goes to LPP Tiger. And uh, I know that other software are doing more or less the same. So I guess that's developed, the software is developing and people are working together to yeah. try and make improvements. So the software is improving and is instrumentation improving as well uh, to help on the other side of it? I. You know, I am not an analytical chemist, but I can see that there are always innovation coming uh, and uh, I am pretty confident that we are going in the right direction. Every information we can get, not only about the sensitivity of the instrument, but I don't know, CCS libraries or retention time information, every collection we can get and uh, so it is, uh, again, another part that we have not considered yet is the importance of a database that is something that uh, can be considered, but not uh, for spectral comparison or matching. Epilipidome is too broad. We cannot yeah. do it. But it would be very important to have curated data for a few speeches to guide towards the fragmentation pattern, to derive rules, to understand what is in our hands already. And uh, this was also discussed uh, within uh, EpilipidNet uh, recently as a very important point. Yes, and that's that's something we're, we're hoping to work towards yes, in, yes. in the future. It's an extremely challenging but very exciting area of lipidomics that hopefully will produce lots of interesting results in the future. Yeah. Uh, so, Laura, thanks very much for this interesting tour through the challenges of epilipidomics. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. And I hope you'll join us again for the next Lipid Maps podcast.